expressing over there. Yeah, thank you. All right, so now we have a fourth uh, and the last presenter, um, Gordon Young. And Gordon is, uh, is the principal of uh, Ethiological Consulting. Uh, he's a professional ethicist and he offers extensive understanding of the decision-making methodologies, value articulation, challenge management, and strategic planning for anyone, any organization who wants to avail of your expertise, which means that anyone can come to you and ask for a plan of how to implement or how to design uh, ethical decision-making. Right? So, um, Gordon is going to talk about uh, charity does not begin at home, uh, breaking the nation-based narrative on aid. Please, please go. Uh, please do click, click, click that title. And bio, which I've really got to rewrite. I hate my own bio, but either way. So, obviously, uh, just to we're all familiar with this context, a lot of the challenges we're currently facing in terms of ethics are very much globalised in nature these days, yeah? Oftentimes it's described that the world is in its best state it's ever been in many regards. We've had less wars, we've had less poverty, in many regards things are certainly going very well. Unfortunately, many of our existential threats now are global in nature. So economic vulnerability, climate change, overfishing and fisheries collapse. A lot of these turn out to be environmental, yeah? But technological inequality and limited resources, of course. As we can see from the Human Development Index, this is not necessarily an equal situation. Yeah? The Western countries, so-called, are doing significantly better. In particular, I like to call attention to Australia and uh, Indonesia, my next door is, mm. which is nicely highlighted also by this. This is a population density map. Mm. If, uh, is anyone familiar with Indonesia at all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And traffic. Indonesia has 10 times Australia's population. There are more people living in the capital city than are living in the entirety of Australia right now. I have been to Jakarta, I do not wish to return. <laughs> he is as close to Blade Runner as you're ever likely to get. <laughs> when we talk about international aid in particular, migration as well, oftentimes this phrase pops up, charity begins at home. Now the strict etymology of this phrase uh, is open to debate. I've heard it described as charity begins at home as a seed of an idea that you would then take out into the community. Mm -hmm. Of course, how it's actually used in general tends to look a lot more like this. This is a comment. Andre news oh, article. No, he scrolled. <laughs> That's where the ethics are. Oh. Right. Charity begins at home, and as long as there's one single mum sleeping on the street or in a car with their kids, or so on and so on and so forth, then we do not need to spend aid money overseas. You'll notice that this is a very strong ethical argument, right? It's not a question of could we, it's a question of should we, right? We should not spend international money, uh, money overseas in the international aid while there is poverty in Australia. You also know, somewhat compelling, very, very persuasive, hence its popularity. Bearing in mind that this was all in the context of the Australian aid being very heavily slashed five years in a row. It has been decreased in real terms. Yeah? Uh, this is in 2013, AusAid, very, very well, well respected for the most part, organisation completely reformed and subsequently by the other government. And as I said before, the figures have slowly decreased. Now this is not a decrease in our percentage over time, as in it's not that our increase to the aid budget has slowly decreased. This is real terms. Our actual aid budget has decreased over time despite the boom in our economy, despite any sort of inflation. Right? In other words, we have made the conscious decision, as in the federal government at least, has made the conscious decision to decrease aid budget in real terms. Note, Syria happening somewhere around this time period as well. Once again, this is a strong cultural narrative. Dick Smith in particular, while being generally speaking more on the left end of politics and being more generally speaking a more progressive sort of individual, has a strong angle on this. Well, not right there, it says overpopulation will destroy Australia. Australia. Interesting, right? There are three underlying assumptions to this, sorry for that order. That we cannot do both domestic and international aid, that cutting international aid does in fact lead to domestic aid, but most importantly, this third one, that we owe our citizens 
of our nation are high responsibility, high responsibility to the non-citizens. I'm not really going to address the first two points, partly because they're fairly minor and partly because they're so blatantly false, it's ridiculous. But let's focus on the third, which is far more compelling and also quite intuitive, yeah? That's the entire point of the nation. You become a citizen of the nation or a born citizen of the nation, it is the nation's responsibility to look after your interests. Is this valid? Because this would be the underlying point behind the whole charity begins at home concept. So let's look at some of the justifications for that theory. Is it the volume of people being affected? Quite clearly not. <laughs> Is it a matter of need? Well, you could look at this in two different ways. You could look at this from a utilitarian, a qualitative sort of, or quantitative sort of approach in terms of actual physical needs. Well, there you go. The quality of life, human development index shows that we're doing quite well here as opposed to Indonesia, which is right next door. But then you could also look at it from a deontological point of view, which we also aren't really doing very well at here. Yeah? The deontological point of view saying that you like, owe a duty to your own citizens. Well. Human Charter of Human Rights? Are you in the Charter of Human Rights? Human Development Index? Competing deontological uh, framework? And a far more fundamental one? So, not terribly compelled there either. What about proximity though? Yeah, we all live in the same country. They're my neighbours, right? They're fellow citizens. I owe my neighbours a higher duty of care than I owe someone living on the other side of the planet, right? I encourage you to look at the scale <laughs> of the country we happen to live in. What do I have? What, do I have anything in common with someone in WA in terms of proximity? Are they my neighbours? I don't think so. New Zealand is actually closer, right? So those out of the way, let's look at the more serious one: the shared qualities, which is much more what we talk about here. We have a nice little word map of Australian values, such as the Australian people, or more to the point, the Australian government would like us to believe. Right? Not very compelling. And yes, we do have shared culture to a very large degree. Mm. And then again, we don't. <laughs> I didn't look very far to find this. Right. There are people in Queensland who I have significantly less in common with in a cultural sense than people in Indonesia. There's a couple of very prominent people in Victoria I have significantly less in common with than virtually anyone in the world. <laughs> right. So that cultural factor starts to break down when you actually start asking this question. Within any group of people, this starts to break down very quickly. You get a group of 10 people, you'll find two of those people that loathe each other, right? In a nation, just look at our political system, the simple fact is, is that no matter where in the political system you fall, at least half of the rest of the population is wrong from your perspective. So we're not perhaps as united as we once thought. Quite apart from anything else, having a look at the word map on the left-hand side, apart from the multiple iterations of Australia, are there any qualities in there that are not shared by other cultures? Mm -hmm freedom my ass, right? No one ever defines that term. Sorry to get a little bit annoyed, but it really does irritate me. You could make a much more strong argument that as a citizen of the nation, we're all subject to the same laws and principles. Though that does, of course, assume that we are, in fact, all subject to the same laws and principles. The indigenous communities <coughs> up in Northern Territory would have something to say about that. And certain one percenters would also have something to say about that in Cambodia justice, right? It's also a fairly low bar to set, right? And then of course, sorry about again, the emanation is stuffed up there. You could also argue that we have more skin in the game. We pay taxation. We pay taxation and therefore we should have more contribution back from the nation that we're paid into with our work and with our tax. Of course, that would be a lot more compelling again if we all did pay that taxation, ignoring again the number of people at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum who do not pay tax and the people at the top of this spectrum who find ways of not paying tax. Also, ignoring, as you'll see on the right-hand side there, the massive input that other nations have into our economy. We would not be doing quite so well post-GFC if China hadn't been there to buy our and all. To illustrate this once again, out here, rising German nationalism, first time for quite a long time, it has, has been said that Germans get an unfair sort of shellacking for this sort of thing. They're not allowed to be proud of their nation at all. But at the same time, seeing it rise up again is kind of interesting. And you could even extend this back to you know, the Nazi period and so forth, where you're talking about German pride, right? Identification with your country, our nation. This is what Deutschland looked like. 
Friday, 1871. What German pride? What Germany? Talking about Australian pride, the country's only been in existence for 200 years in its current form. We don't like to talk about it before then, do we? In other words, what I'm trying to illustrate here is the nationhood is a constructed concept. Now, it's not a revolutionary idea. But what I'm going to take this further is by saying that it's an arbitrary concept. It's a concept that we choose to impose upon ourselves. Very, very similar, you'll note, to race. And it's equally scientifically invalid. Right? So why? Why? Why are we imposing this? Right? Lacking any objective basis, prioritizations over non-citizens lacks a justification. So what do we have instead? An appeal to consequence, quite frankly. This is not about our share qualities. It's about not wanting to share. Because we don't like what the consequence would be if we were to acknowledge the fact that we don't owe a higher duty to our citizens than non citizens. Why do we owe a higher duty to Australian citizens as opposed to Indonesians? Because we don't want to uh, compromise our quality of life. Quite simple. Which comes down to a very nice little maxim that uh, little bon mot, uh, if you'll excuse the phrasing, got mine, fuck you. Really does come down to that, which builds quite nicely to the point that was made earlier on in terms of that the borders are drawn by force. Mm. So, taking this into account, and also taking into account, oh, yeah. So, using a, either a utilitarian or a deontological approach, frankly, it's easily demonstrated that age should be based on need. Yeah, looking at this, it doesn't get a lot more simple than this. The number of people affected in the the degree to which they affect it has always been a very compelling argument for who needs the most attention. Triage within hospitals, within humanitarian environments, or so on and so forth. It's always been very, very similar to this. Now, there is one qualification to this, which is the question of effectiveness. There is very little point in equal distribution of the wealth if it doesn't help anyone. There's very little point in international aid if it doesn't actually achieve its goals. And God knows that's been a serious problem in any sort of humanitarian work in the past. That said, that is not relevant to this point, because that is a practical question that is always relevant. It must be addressed regardless of circumstances, whether it's domestic aid, whether it's international aid, whether it's a small number of people, a large number of people, whether it's abstract policy or simple practicalities. If it doesn't work, it's not worth your time, right? That is an important question, and there's been a significant amount of research and work into that sort of space. Good, transfer it. What we're talking about here is who, the, who deserves the prioritization. And as such, when people like Dick Smith make this argument that overpopulation will destroy Australia, well, maybe. But what he's implicitly saying there right now is he's quite happy with overpopulation destroying Indonesia. Doesn't care. Right? Prioritization of citizens over non citizens is effectively outsourcing suffering. Will book. So, once again, looking at that population density, this only gets worse in terms of those global priorities, uh, those global challenges we're currently facing. What is going to happen when the sea level rises one metre? Half a metre. This cuts us both directions. We can look at this and go like, well, yes, that might be true, but I'm still quite happy preserving my quality of life over Indonesia or anyone else associated with it. This will still hurt us. That water goes up half a metre. 80% of Indonesia lives on a coastal region. Where are they going to go? Other developing countries? Don't think so. Either we deal with this proactively or we deal with it reactively, and reactive is always the worst option. You really have, you have two options at that stage. The water level goes up, they will come south. And at that point, you've got two options. You can deal with the largest refugee crisis the world has ever known. Or we can commit genocide. Your choice. Choose one. Right? Proactively managing this is a question, and allowing that charity begins at home narrative to stand will prevent us from doing so. Anyone got any questions? I feel like I got through that fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's good. Uh, very interesting. I think now we can uh, have questions. Maybe we can start off with uh, Gordon. Uh, and then. Uh, uh, yes, more comment on Dick Smith. Because I've seen that, of course. and. Uh, fits into your map that you showed a number of times. Um, Australia is all populated because, in his view, he didn't say that, because we are 
to spend the, the, we have the highest water expenditure per capita, even though we dry spot. Mm -hmm. We have the highest residential um, space per capita in the world, mm -hmm. etc., etc. So uh, that means cooling, heating, very high energy expenditure, mm -hmm. not as high as Americans though. They still uh, waste more energy than us. But in that case, of course, if you want to continue living like that, and everyone who comes to Australia aspires to that kind of level of luxury, then of course we can't take any, anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, the new mansions, I think the average uh, size of the uh, outskirts of Melbourne mansions is 400 mm -hmm. square meters. Mm -hmm. so that's average, 400 square meters, mm -hmm. and average, popu ever, average household size is 2.5 people. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, that's not overpopulation, seriously, it's underpopulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the house. Yeah. 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 Just asking a question how you ended on the, the Indonesian map and half a meter of sea rise. And so, and keeping in view that Pacific solution in my mind, the mind boggling figures that we have overstairs, mm. this number is too high. And referring recent ABC news that uh, the Chinese passports on Chinese passports students are coming and they send back the passports to their uh, other colleagues and they are coming other Chinese are coming on that so such type of scams are going on which are in thousands why that 500 boat people are exposed <laughs> in that extent what is the political sense behind uh, this whole thing. Can you elaborate something on that? Mm, yeah, I have very particular thoughts on the whole <laughs> issue. Frankly, I think it comes down to it's just the scaremongering. Simple as that. It's always been a rank hypocrisy surrounding the whole boat people situation. Was, you, you came by boat, you go through these ridiculous outsourcing and legal frameworks. It's like, dude, you fly in, mm. you're good. Mm. Process in the community, we don't give a shit. Right. In other words, it's not a question of actual threat to the country. We get, I think, something like four times as many people claiming asylum by plane. Mm -hmm. If there was actual any plausible threat to the country, we'd be doing something about it. There's more people, I believe, that are coming over and staying illegally from New Zealand and the UK. Mm -hmm. Right. So where's the attention on that? Right? It's never been an issue of actual threat. Yeah, it's always it been the government saw a prime opportunity and it worked. Let's be very clear on this. It worked very, very well. Scary boogeyman. We can wedge the community on this, and we can keep making it worse. The government's now in a win-win position. If the boats arrive, they get to say, look, threat. If the boats don't arrive, they get to say, we were. They're profited off brutality, simple as that. And they'll keep doing it because it's in their interests, and Labor won't fight them because it's not in Labor's interests to do so. Yeah. I want super simple question. Um, is anyone here from Australia? Yeah. It's a uh, ethnological because I've never seen that word before the first time. Yeah, uh, it's in retrospect probably not a great choice of name because ethological is the study of cow herd movements. It's an important distinction though. Yeah. Yeah, I think herd psychology was actually really and good. Most people wouldn't know that. It's a conversation starter. They were a member of your organization. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. The cow herding guy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> With ethical consulting sounds pretty good, so and everyone understands it. Yeah, any questions for Val or uh, I had a for... question about um, the, the discussion you talked about the, the foreign skilled workers and I, I yeah. would like to kind of broaden it uh, from just medical and health workers because I went through that experience of being told I was qualified on a shortage occupation to come into the country and then when I got here I found that A there was a state system so I had to be very careful where I lived and B each of the states was going to require me to go through a, a different process in order to carry out my occupation even yeah. though I've been given residency. So why why is this still happening, do you think? Why is there the difference between what DIAC at the time or the, the immigration people are saying to people to, for them to come in to set the expectation that we need people with your qualifications and we actually are gonna prefer you over other people who want to come in because you have these occupations. But then when you get here, why are they setting that? What, how would we arrive to the point where there's this false expectation but it's not where there's no collaboration or correlation between what the government is saying and what the professional bodies are saying. Uh, yeah, so a, a variety of different 
reasons. One is um, to do with political <coughs> will, uh, which is to say, um, you know, do when the, when the immigrant professional comes in, um, are they seen by sort of local state um, politicians and, 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 and groups as being a stakeholder in the same way that an internal uh, person would? And 